Hi, and welcome back for our third installment of our class on domain names. In today's class, I'll continue the discussion on resolving domain name disputes by covering the Lanham Act, also known as the Trademark Act. This act can be applied to domain names and allow the plaintiff to recover the domain name in question, as well as monetary damages related to the suit. The Anti-Cyber Squad and Consumer Protection Act strengthened the protection of mark holders by easing the standards that were typically needed to prove a trademark case when it involved domain names. Generally speaking, the Lanham Act as a whole prohibits trademark infringement, trademark dilution, and false advertising in the United States. It provides for three instances in which a trademark owner can sue a domain registrant for violation of his or her trademark. Trademark infringement, trademark dilution, and cyber piracy. Let's explore each of these causes of action, starting with trademark infringement. Trademark infringement occurs when the use of a trademark in connection with the sale of goods is likely to cause consumer confusion as to the source of those goods or as to the sponsorship or approval of such goods. The definitive question in an infringement claim normally boils down to the likelihood of confusion element. The courts have considered a number of factors in determining whether consumers are likely to be confused, including the strength of the mark, the proximity of the goods, the similarity of the marks, evidence of actual confusion, the similarity of marketing channels used, the degree of caution exercised by typical purchaser, and the defendant's intent. One thing to note about trademark infringement is that the use of your mark has to be in connection with commercial activity. Without the sale of goods, there is no trademark infringement. A website that doesn't offer products or services is not likely to be liable for trademark infringement. The next cause of action lies in trademark dilution. Trademark dilution can be brought against any use of a mark that dilutes the distinctive quality of the mark. In federal court, a plaintiff's mark has to be famous in order to file suit. There are several factors that the courts consider when determining if a participant is famous, including the degree of inherent or acquired distinctiveness, the duration and extent of use, the amount of advertising and publicity, the geographic extent of the market, the channels of trade, the degree of recognition in trading areas, any use of similar marks by third parties, and whether the mark is registered. A trademark is usually found to be famous if the owner can prove that the mark is widely recognized by the general consuming public as a designation of source for the goods or services of the mark's owner. A claim can be brought in most state courts, even if the mark is not famous. The requirement is usually that the mark has selling power or a distinctive quality, and the two marks are substantially similar. Unlike in a trademark infringement claim, there is no need to establish a likelihood of confusion. Instead, the plaintiff can show dilution in one of two ways, through blurring or tarnishment. Blurring occurs when the power of the mark is weakened through its identification with the similar goods. Tarnishment occurs when the mark is cast in an unflattering light typically through its association with inferior or unseemly products or services. Cyber piracy prohibits the use of domain names that are identical or confusingly similar to a famous or distinctive mark at the time of registration. This prohibition only applies if the defendant registered the domain name in bad faith. The court has to determine the defendant's level of culpability as part of its bad faith analysis and uses several factors to decide if the defendant acted in bad faith. Those factors include the registrant's trademark or other intellectual property rights in the domain name, whether the domain name contains the registrant's legal or common name, the registrant's prior use of the domain name in connection with the bona fide offering of goods or services, the registrant's bona fide non-commercial or fair use of the mark and a site accessible by the domain name, the registrant's intent to divert customers from the mark owner's online location that could harm the goodwill represented by the mark for commercial gain or with the intent to tarnage or disparage the mark, the registrant's offer to transfer, sell, or otherwise assign a domain name to the mark owner or a third party for financial gain without having used the mark in a legitimate site. 
the registrants providing misleading false contact information when applying for registration of the domain name. The registrant's registration or acquisition of multiple domain names that are identical or confusingly similar to marks of others, and the extent to which the mark in the domain is distinctive or famous. These factors are meant to help guide the court to their decision and may not be the only things considered in your lawsuit. One of the things we mentioned earlier in the course was that there are hundreds of jurisdictions where domain name disputes can arise. This gives rise to the legal problem of jurisdiction. Our national laws may not reach the jurisdiction where the potential defendant resides, or in some instances, it may be impossible to determine who the owner of the domain actually is due to fraudulent registration information. In these cases, a party can proceed with their suit in any jurisdiction where the domain name registrar or other registering authority resides. This will more than likely give you an option to sue locally and at least get the domain canceled. There is also a statute that protects individuals from having their name registered as a domain name. This particular statute states that any person who registers a domain name that consists of the name of another living person or a name substantially and confusingly similar thereto, without that person's consent, with the specific intent to profit from such name by selling the domain name for the financial gain to that person or any third party shall be liable in a civil action by such person. This statute won't stop someone from registering your domain name, but it will stop someone who is trying to resell you your own name. A defendant involved in any of these three causes of action can present defenses as to why they are not guilty of the infringement. The two most commonly raised defenses are fair use and parity. Fair use is asserted when a descriptive mark is used in good faith for its primary rather than secondary meaning, and no consumer confusion is likely to result. In this situation, the trademarked phrase is being used in a purely descriptive context, which is not meant to invoke the secondary meaning of the mark. As a result, courts have held that no infringement occurs in a fair use situation. The parity defense derives itself from the First Amendment's protection of free speech. Most late-night television comedy shows make use of parody when they criticize individuals and corporations. This type of activity is protected and free from civil liability, which is why it can be raised as a valid defense. Some courts have also adopted the idea of nominative fair use. This type of fair use comes from the idea that sometimes it is necessary to use a trademark to identify and talk about another party's products or services. In order to establish nominative fair use, a party would have to prove that it did one of the following. It used the trademark of another because the product or service cannot be readily identified without using the trademark. It only used as much of the mark as is necessary for the identification. The use does nothing to suggest sponsorship or endorsement by the trademark holder. If a defendant can successfully raise one of these defenses, the suit should be dismissed. In all three causes of action, a plaintiff can request for injunctive and monetary relief. Injunctive relief allows a court to order the registrar to cancel the domain or suspend it while litigation is ongoing. Any violation of this court order is punishable by contempt for violating the order. A person may be fined and imprisoned if held in contempt for failing to abide by an order of the court. The court can also order monetary relief as an award to the prevailing party. These awards could include the defendant's profits in association with the use of your trademark, any damages the plaintiff suffered as a result of the infringement, the cost of the action, and attorney's fees. There are also specific statutory damages available at the election of the plaintiff for an individual that violates the cyber piracy portion of the trademark statute. These damages call for an award of not less than $1,000 and not more than $100,000 per domain name. Taking the statutory damages precludes you from other forms of monetary relief, such as the ones I have just described but it also allows a plaintiff to escape the responsibility of proving profits and actual damages suffered in court. All right, let's wrap things up. Today we talked about the Lanham Act, also known as the Trademark Act. It provides a registered mark holder three routes to pursue a lawsuit against the person who registers a domain name in violation of trademark law. 
Those options include trademark infringement, trademark dilution, and cyber piracy. A trademark infringement suit is determined by looking at the likelihood of confusion between the alleged infringing mark and the owner's mark. Trademark dilution doesn't use the likelihood of confusion test, but instead defines two instances when trademark has been diluted, blurring and tarnishment. Blurring occurs when the power of the mark is weakened through its identification with the similar goods, and tarnishment occurs when the mark is cast in an unflattering light, typically through association with inferior or unseemly products or services. A plaintiff can ask for both injunctive and monetary relief under the Trademark Act, and a defendant can raise fair use and parity as defenses to sue. That's our class for today. Tune in next time when we introduce the next topic in our course, copyright. Thanks for watching. See you next time.